Thanks for picking our presentation out of those others that were very interesting. So welcome to the presentation titled Consumer Driven Contracts and Your Microservice Architecture. So before we go to the main topic, we're going to say a few words about ourselves. So my name is uh, Marcin Grzejszczak. I work for Spring Cloud team. Uh, and I'm leading those three projects, Loof, Contract, and Pipelines. Uh, you can connect with me at Twitter, at mgrzejszczak. I know that it's impossible to pronounce it, so go to my blog, to matchcoding.com, and you can copy my Twitter handle from there. Uh, hi, guys. I'm Deep Saikali. I'm part of the platform architecture team uh, for Pivotal, working out of uh, Toronto, Canada. And I spend all my time working with customers, helping them adopt uh, some of these cloud-native patterns and just be successful migrating old legacy applications onto uh, new ways of doing things. You know, this is kind of a very typical conversation uh, we run into uh, with a lot of customers in the enterprise where you know, everybody's like, hey, I wish I had a green field, and I wish that uh, you know, then I'm definitely not going to make the mistakes of the past. And I'm sure all of you have had that thought more than once per week, every week. But then, you know, what I've also learned is that when you're done, it's kind of sometimes you feel like you did it, but you did it slightly differently. And, uh, you know, it's, it's hard to break old habits. Um, so if you're going to organize your code, you know, this is typically how, if you're, if you're a programmer, here's how you, this is how you would do it, right? Everybody likes that? So generally you would pick all the services together, controllers together, impulse together, right? And if you had to write a novel, it would look like this. So, so here's, uh, you know, um, Marcin, I, I hear you know a thing or two about testing, right? Yeah, I heard about this too, so I yeah. can maybe I'm, help you somehow. Yeah, I'm working on this project right now, and unfortunately, you know, it, it kind of looks like this diagram right here. Um, I've got this uh, legacy service that I, I work on, and I call this thing called the Customer Rental History Service, which then calls a mainframe, and it, it calls a payment processor, and in all these lines, there are just HTTP calls on the, on the diagram. And, and the challenge that I have is that it's really, really hard for me to test this legacy service because this customer rental, his, customer rental history service is just like impossible to set up. So it's really hard. And, and so we have a shared one instance that we run in our dev environment, but then every once in a while, somebody decides to run a performance test and everything breaks. And then but you have tests. That, that's, uh, that's a surprise. We have a little bit of tests. Okay. I mean, uh, one. Yeah, I think, okay. we, I think I've tried writing one test. That's more than zero. Yeah, you, you know, I, I think I have a copy of the code if you want to oh. take a look at it. Sure, I mean... Uh, uh, oh, yes, but before I do that, this is kind of our testing strategy right now. Are you so, good with putting, like, code in the... or, like, architecture in the slides, right? Hey, man, I'm an architect now. I only understand code oh. if it fits on a slide. Okay, good. So <laughs> all the coding, on, okay. you, you're going to have to, like, actually do that, okay? Oh, uh, okay. All right. Fair enough. So, uh, so yeah. this is your ID, right? The slides. Absolutely. Good. I'm, I'm just transitioning. I'm, I'm, it's becoming cloud native. I went from PowerPoint to Google Slides. Good, good, so. good, good. So, you know, it's, uh, it's, it's like our testing strategy has been one of uh, we're going to hard code some stubs, and we're going to deploy those stubs inside of the legacy service. This way, when the code gets called, it doesn't actually make a network call to the customer rental history service, and I don't so have to So you're not testing the HTTP integration at all? Uh, you know, I tried reading the HTTP specs, but I didn't know how to implement an HTTP server. So I, I decided this was much easier to do. Yeah, uh, fair enough. Makes sense. But it would be great if I could. Okay. Um, and this is kind of a little bit of the challenge that happens with this thing. You know, when it gets back a response, it's only 1,200 lines long. And I don't really know that the stub actually, that, uh, that's hand-coded, actually looks anything like this JSON. Uh, it just takes a little bit too much effort um, to, to determine if it works or not. And I actually have the code on the slide, if you want to see. Oh, OK. <laughs> Let's see some code. Oops, not this one. <laughs> okay. So, so this is the code, right? Um, so yeah. I, let's, let's see what we have here. Uh, maybe let's check out the cable. <laughs> okay, so this is your code? Oh, yeah. <laughs> like endless black hole? Yeah. <laughs> Any questions so far? <laughs> yeah. I'm going to do what every developer would tell, like uh, the user, like 
Can you turn it off and on again? Yeah. So maybe I'm gonna just, you know, pick the laptop and show the screen like this. Maybe actually just move it off of this so it doesn't. <laughs> so this is a fake, fix on production, right? No, no, this is, this is pivotal pair programming here. Perfect, perfect, that's, that's great. Uh, so, uh, of course the modules are really nice, like API, impl, right? In, in yeah, yeah, this, is, this was kind of the official corporate standard. We okay. were supposed to do that, because then we would have different people, like the architects, like me, define the APIs, and like the developers would implement everything uh, else. Okay, okay, so let's start with the, uh, with the entry point. So we have controllers and services, that's, that's nice. Uh, yep. Oh, this is a nice name. So we have fraud detection impl base controller. Yes, it's so weird. It's a, it's, we love long names. Yeah, and uh, it shows that it's a, an implementation. That's good, right? Correct. Because yes, yes. Without, without this, I wouldn't know. Okay. No, no. How would you know? Okay, so we, uh, maybe I'll read if I understand this correctly. Yeah, so yeah, yeah. you have a RESTful API because you have a get mapping to customer name get fraud get. Yes. So it's like you really want to get it, right? Absolutely. Okay, good. good. Okay, and. Um, I, uh, you have nice comments, right? This is I smell NPE. That's Th good. That's the, yeah, you know. It's, this is static analysis, right? Uh, yeah, we, we, we tried. Maybe like the code reviewer left that code in there, like comments. Okay. But I don't know if the developer actually like, did anything with it. Okay. So uh, you call some manager. Let's see what this uh, manager thing is. So if I click here. Um, okay, so it's an interface, right? It's, it's okay. absolutely an interface, yeah. It's just going to retrieve a list of the charges from the... For a given person, right? For a given person, yeah. We just give their names and you get the list of the charges. And like, if it's empty, then you know, they're all good. And if it's oh, okay. otherwise, they're, okay. they're not. Okay, good, good. Um, that, that's, that's pretty neat. Uh, so you, you mentioned something that you have tests. So maybe let's... Yeah, let's, let's take a look at that. I mean, a test. So let's check out this test. Uh, okay, so this is customer rental history manager impl tests. Yeah, yeah. So we were auto wiring. This is what I was talking about earlier. We auto wire in the uh, customer uh, rental history manager, but uh, it's a fake one, right? Yeah, it's a fake one. If you oh, scroll so, down, so you have a primary here. Yeah. That returns. Oh, I like the name. It returns the stub. That's right. There's only one stub because okay. it's too hard to write them manually. Okay, so <laughs> let's open this because you, if you had more, it would be a stub. Yeah, or maybe okay. we just call them stub one, stub two, stub three. Okay, so uh, this is the stub, right? So it, uh, well, it creates like three charges for three different people? Yeah, you know, but like the problem with it, I'm looking at this, I, I tried like, like, you know, we tried typing in all these fields from the different JSONs and they were just, just too much, man. Like who wants to sit there and recreate a 1200 line JSON structure in, in Java? So this has been the extent of our testing efforts. Okay, I mean, at least you have it, one it, test. It was good enough to pass the pipeline, okay? It had the, coverage limits, and this was enough. Oh, OK, good. Oh, yeah, because you need a test result, yeah. like any test. But yeah. you could have just written assert true equals true. Uh, I didn't think of that. Um, oh, man, good idea. I will be doing that from yeah. now on. Anyways, um, so uh, maybe let's, uh, I mean, this is the best you, you could do at this point, right? So. But this is why we're talking. Like, I was yeah. told you're the testing expert. You can help me with this code. OK, let's try something. So uh, maybe let's try to change in that way that we will we'll actually try to make the call, right? Yeah. So the stub lays in the, the stub, stubs module. So how about we try to define something called a contract? OK. So a contract is an agreement between the API the producer and the consumer on how we will communicate, you know? OK. So well, Sounds good. So Can maybe just... let's, let's start with this. So uh, before we do it, we have to add a plugin. I'm going to add the plugin, which is the Spring Cloud Contract Maven plugin. OK. okay. I've added the plugin. Now I'm going to the test resources contracts. Oh, that's a new directory. I'm not familiar with that. Is that where you keep all the contracts? Yeah, that's why we call it contracts. Oh, let me see. OK. So yeah, um, so this is an example of a contract. Um, can you try to like, read yeah, it? Yeah, yeah. So, so that's, I see. Okay, so the contract, we're making a contract. We're giving it a description. Uh, should return a list of all charges. It looks like we're making a request and a response. I see that there's a, the request is an HTTP GET. That's good. But it only says get once. Yeah, I mean, I'm sorry. Oh. I want to get it only once. OK, all right, good, good. And then looks like I can pass some parameters to that. that. That looks pretty easy. And the response is like status. Is that status 200 or the price is $200 because it's a contract? Uh, 
It depends. It depends. You okay. know, in this case, it's like status 100. Okay, so that's okay, right? HTTP okay, and it looks like the response that gets returned is returned from a charges.json file. Yeah, that's exactly this. Oh, cool. So let's let's focus on this section, like consumer file. So over here in the in the charges.json, we have this beautiful JSON of yours, like 1,200 lines. So that's exactly it. So uh, in Spring Cloud Contract, you define contracts in Groovy, in Groovy DSL. Yeah. So don't run, don't run away if you hate Groovy. It's just a DSL, and if you have an IDE and you click, you know, command, it helps you. So these are methods, real methods, no dynamic bits, right? Uh, in in so, fact, I don't know Groovy and I haven't run away, so. Oh, that's good, yeah. that's good. Uh, maybe, you know, if I put it on, on a slide, it would be even better for you. Yes, absolutely. Okay. So, Right now, from the contract, if I executed Maven clean install, some things would happen. I'm not going to do it because of the technical problems we had. For sure, it's not going to sure, work. Sure. Uh, so, assuming that I've done this in target, we would have under stops folder, mm -hmm. under mappings, a beautiful file, a beautiful JSON. So, what happened is from the contract, mm -hmm. we have generated a stop. Oh, so what kind of stub is this? How, I thought the stubs were supposed to be Java code. This is just a JSON file. Yeah. Uh, are you familiar with something called a, like a tool called Wiremark? Yeah, I heard about it. It's like, I thought this Wiremark tool was this, like, it, it reads some sort of, oh, yeah, it reads a configuration JSON file. And then when you make it request to it, I guess if it comes to, like, V1 charges with a get and a query limit of 25, it would respond with this, man, that JSON in JSON looks Yeah, cool. I mean, I know that it, you Sorry, like my eyes. embedding a JSON in a JSON, but sorry, I, I mean, we did it for you, so. I, I don't do it because that never fits on a slide. <sighs> yeah, that's true. Yeah, so the first thing we've managed to do is generate a stub that is understandable by Wiremock uh, from the contract. So let's try to actually do something with this stub, sure. right? Sure, I, so, I'm, I'm. So, can I, can I refactor this code? Please, go ahead. This is like, you know, uh, I, I'd love a recipe that's, that actually works for this. So let's, let's maybe remove this, uh, this, this stub. Sure. And uh, we're going to make the code compile first. And uh, how would you call it like a component, like a, like a tool that runs stubs? Stub runner? OK, that's a good name. So let's do auto configure stub runner. Now, when I executed Maven clean install mm -hmm. on the stubs, what happened was a stubs jar got yeah. installed in yeah. my local M2. Great. So, so there's actually you're producing two files when you compile with Maven, right? The actual code for the legacy service and the stub. Exactly. So if we, if we check out the target over here, we will see that we have this, the jar with the yeah. code and the stubs jar. And it got installed in my Maven local. So what I'm going to do right now, and if we check out the POM, you'll see that the group ID is come example, and the artifact ID is the legacy app stops. Right, yes. Okay? Yes, yes. So now in the test, if we go back to the test, I'm going to say IDs, come example, the legacy app stops, pick the latest version with classifier stops, and register it at port 9876. Okay. And I say the stops are in my local M2. Okay, okay. makes sense. So now you mentioned something like before the talk that you have a special property that we can set to um, like a, uh, where your external API, the one yeah. that you're calling yeah. is. Yeah. What yes, was the property? Right. I think it's called api.url or something API. like that. API.url okay. equals HTTP localhost 9876. That's correct? Yeah. So let's try to run it. Hold on a second. You, you, you mean all I have to do is just mark it up with this at auto configure stub runner and it's going to launch the wire mark for me? Yeah, so it, what it's going to do is going to launch, it's going to uh, find the stops, download them from either your, in this case, your local M2 okay. or some remote place. It's going to download those stops, start a wire mark server, and feed it with stops. Okay, cool. Let's see that. Assuming that the demo is going to work. <clears throat> Hopefully. Yeah. Okay. Oh, red. But the, the tests have failed. Let's see why. Oh, yeah, the charges don't. This doesn't look anything like the real stub, the AVC, does it? Oh, yeah. It? So let's check out the log. So what we can see here is what Wiremock is there. Something yeah, happened, yeah. right? So we started Wiremock. And Wiremock says, hey, you sent me a request get to v1 charges limit 25, right? And I responded with 
what I had in the stub, so this is your yep. beautiful JSON, right? And if we scroll to the very bottom, we'll see what failed. Oh, so previously in your tests, you had this fake stub that returned only three customers, right? And yep. only those that have names ABC, right? You know, it was the charges actually, and, and I just like, you know, whatever. Yeah, ABC, that's right. So. So it's, it's it terrible. Doesn't, yeah, it doesn't work. represent reality, but yeah. so, no passing tests there. So we just did it for the pipeline, man. Yeah, sure. So uh, we could do plenty of assertions here. So let's make like a simple one that's going to pass. So, so uh, from the JSON, twenty-five charges got. Uh, returned, yeah, yeah. Right? We can we can check if it so actually is returning let's twenty-five. Let's check this, and but, let's run this again. Yeah, I think I heard there are some cool libraries out there for asserting and you know going into JSON structures and checking that stuff is there. Yeah, you could use it actually here, you know, uh, to verify JSONs via JSON path, okay. etc. Oh, so the test has passed. Cool. Okay, so let's go back to our slides. Can you like uh, because you like to make the yeah minutes, slides? It's yeah. me, man. If it's so, code, it's you. So maybe you would like walk us through what happened. Yeah. So I, I I think if I understand this correctly, is that you know, we use this Groovy DSL to write the contract, and from the contract, we ran that through the Spring Cloud Contract Maven plugin, which was very cool because it then took the effort of outputting and interpreting the contract to make the wire mock stub for us. And it created that into a stubs jar, which we can now publish to our Maven repository for everybody to reuse. And, and so what this, I think, will allow us to do is is that now, when I'm, if I'm going to be a user of the legacy service, uh, say, for example, the audit service, uh, I, can, I can have an integration test which, where the audit service calls the legacy service, and the legacy service turns around, and it actually makes an HTTP call to localhost 876, a port number that I pick and control. Um, and that way, I'm actually doing like an integration test that's predictable because now I don't get affected if the shared customer, the, the in development, the shared instance of customer rental history service, if that is down or overloaded because of a performance test, uh, everything works. And so it's, there's really like four steps. Uh, you know, as a developer, step one is you're going to write that contract with in, in Groovy uh, to define the interaction between your uh, uh, the, the consumer and the producer of the API. And then after you do that, you just go into your project, very simple, cut and paste in the Maven plugin or the Gradle plugin uh, for, uh, for Spring Cloud Contract once you've configured it in your project. Uh, then you can write an integration test. And in your integration test, you add that extra annotation, the at auto configure stub runner. Um, I think you should have called it road runner, you know, like the cartoon. I'm going to do can, it for version I, V3, maybe, okay. of the library. Cool. Uh, and then after, after, you have the, after you configure the stub runner, then what you do is you then take the integration tests that you have and you put them in your CI CD pipeline, except that when they run, they just go, you're just doing look back on localhost to, uh, uh, to the wire mark stubs. It makes it much easier for you to actually test the code that you're interested in testing rather than the environment than testing the environment in which the code is running. That's a beautiful slide, by the way. I do my best, man. OK, so um, you mentioned something that uh, the owners of this customer rental history service, they, um, like, they are a little bit afraid of, uh, let's say, starting the whole stubbing process. Uh, so um, you yeah, mentioned something like, about like, like, making them like, involved in the whole process. It would be really good if, like, because I think we put the contract in my code. I'm a client of the customer rental yeah. history. It'd be better if they actually had the contract with them. Is there a way to do that? Yeah, because you also mentioned that often, in, especially in banks, for security reasons, you cannot clone yeah, somebody else's for code. Right? For sure, those guys running the customer rental history one, they don't give me access to the code. Like, I only mm -hmm. can see the projects in Bitbucket that I work on. OK, so, so there is a way to solve this, not a problem. Okay. So if we, we, what we can do is we can store the contracts in some you know, external, like in some other repository. Okay. All the contracts are in one Git repository. The contracts have to be in a specific, um, it's a folder. There has to be certain uh, structure of these folders. And it happens by chance that mm -hmm. I have it already created. Oh, cool. Awesome. So we have a repository. 
that has the following structure. We have source main resources contract. Okay. You can see the main piece there. Okay. Why? Because from this repository, we will build a jar with mm -hmm. all the contracts in your company. So that means that if I do the at stub runner from the generated jar, I can launch any one of the, interact with any one of the, the dependencies. That, that, that's also possible. Okay. Um, the most important thing is that it gives you a lot of visibility to what's happening in your company. So if we expand the contracts, we will see come example customer rental history. Ah, so we okay. have already prepared for the other team, yeah. their folder with like group ID is come example, their artifact ID is customer rental history. So they have their special folder where they store their contracts. So if we expand this, what we have is fraud detection, okay. which means that customer rental history has one client whose name is fraud detection. Hmm. I think that basically means that if I break someone, I would actually know who I broke. That's exactly this. Oh, sweet. That means I can delete all sorts of stuff. And, and sure. if <laughs> nobody breaks, then, well, it's safe to delete it. That's true. So, so this is how we're going to incentivize the developers to actually make contract tests. If they don't make a contract test and we change something and their code breaks, we'll be like, sorry, you didn't give me a contract test. That's exactly this. Ah. Good. You can, like of that. course, create the, you know, some more, uh, let's say, extensive st the folder structure. Uh, but like in, the, in essence, we have put exactly the same contract that you had in your code over here. So now, if it's in, in a separate repository, everybody can collaborate. And what is more, since you have contracts, all the contracts from your company in, sing in a single place, you can build a living documentation out of it. Oh, how's that? So what you can do is actually scan the whole, um, the whole folder structure for Groovy DSLs mm -hmm. and build whatever documentation you prefer and whatever uh, tool you want. That takes the mystery out of what the code is doing. I don't know if I like I'm sorry, that. I'm sorry. I know that there are some developers that write so complex code that they never get fired. Right. But we have to you know, fight with this, right? OK, all right, fine. I'm willing to try it once. OK, so um, I, I, have to, I have a confession to make. Whoa, I, what, I, what I, did you I, do? Uh, I lied to you. Oh, I expected that. Yeah, so uh, Spriga contract, the plugin does more than just create the stuff. What does it do? What else can it do? So remember this contract? Yeah. So when it's read by the plugin, to the bottom you can see that the Wiremox stub is created, right? But mm -hmm. also what happens is tests are executed. Tests, tests are generated, and, and when you run them, you run the generated tests. We, so we generate tests from the contract. So I can be lazy, and you're going to actually make me a JUnit test that I can run against my API to check that I didn't break any of my consumers? Uh, yeah. That's oh, what man. We do. I mean, we, <laughs> uh, we then charge you. Like, so we send an invoice for every created test, right? Uh -huh. But yeah. OK. And it was a joke. It was a joke. By the way, it was a joke. <laughs> we don't. <laughs> yeah, so um, you mentioned something, as far as I remember, that you have um, two apps that call you. Yeah. So insurance service and audit service, right? Yes, yes. So how about uh, we create contracts for them? Sure, let's do it. OK, let's go back to the code. So we're back in our legacy application. And if we go under source test resources, it happens that I have already created those contracts. Sweet, you're fast, man. So under source test resources contracts, under audit service, mm -hmm. we have a contract for audit service. So you mentioned that there are two cases, yeah. that either you are a fraud or an, you're not a fraud, right? Let's maybe take a lot, another, uh, another look at the, at the controller. So basically, if there are no charges, you're not a fraud. Yeah. If there are some charges, you're a fraud, right? That's right. So let's see the first example. So if you send a request with this beautiful URL, customer, customer, you get, get fraud, get with a get. It's very clear what it's doing. Uh, we want to respond with status 400 yeah. and return a body, pay your debts first. Sounds good. And the other one is customer B, get fraud, get with a get. Mm -hmm. Status 202, you're not a fraud. Yeah, that, that, that makes sense. It's really cool. Like I, it looks like I can make contracts for all the key interactions between the consumer and the producer yep. of the API. That's the, okay. that's the thing. So, Assuming, again, that I have already executed Maven clean install, under target generated test sources, 
we have an audit service test. Wow. Audit okay. service test. So <laughs> if we click it, we'll see the following. Should return a fraud. Validate should return a fraud. So this yeah. is the name of the contract. OK. You said that if I send a get method to customer, customer, get fraud, get. Mm -hmm. What should happen is in the response, you should have 400. The content type should be application JSON. And the body of the response should be payer debts first. Is that correct? That is correct. But I'm looking at this. Does this generate a code that looks properly formatted like, like one of my best developers could have written? Maybe, maybe I've been able to write you know, this. They, um, they pay me for making this look really good. So, so does that mean the developers have to send you a percentage of their paycheck now because you're writing the test for them? That's what I hope they'll do. OK, good. Find out his Bitcoin address so you can send him some money. So yeah, you don't have to do it. Just you, def you define the contract, and we yeah. generate a test for it. I, I'm, I'm liking that. Now, uh, let's go back to the test. It's somewhere here. Uh, sorry, to the controller. Uh, you mentioned that this manager is an interface. Right? That's right, yeah. And the real implementation goes to the external API, right? Correct, yeah. So in the contract tests, would you agree that we want those tests to be really fast? We don't really want to verify the implementation, but we want to verify the interaction, if we can communicate, yeah. right? Yeah, exactly, because like, I just assume that that thing I'm calling is going to somehow work. It's being managed by a team. I just want to make sure I'm sending them the right stuff, because we do a lot of, like, you know, typically what happens is I can, if there's an issue, we say, hey, something is wrong with your API, and they'll say, no, 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 you sent me the wrong stuff. And we go like this back and forth, and we say, can we access the logs, and then, by the time we get to the logs, it always ends up being something we did wrong, or they changed and didn't tell us. So yeah. really, they always change something and they don't tell us. So the, the same case would be if you access the database, right, from this man manager implementation. We don't yeah. want to do it in the contract test. Right. That's why in the generated tests, if I find those again, what we do, we extend a base class, mm -hmm. right? Why do we do it? So if we check out the base class, there's nothing here because I have to write it, but I'm not going to write it because I would make mistakes. I'm going to copy it. So what we have here is we create the controller, right? And then we inject, since you're not using constructors, but fields, I have to, you know, inject it directly. Thank God you had a package scope field, not a private one, because otherwise I would have to use reflection to inject it, so. I'm waiting for Java 9. You won't be able to do that anymore. <laughs> sure. So I'm injecting a fake manager yeah. implementation where I say, hey, if, if it's a customer A, mm -hmm. respond with a single charge, right? OK, yeah, yeah. So simulate that you're a fraud. Mm -hmm. And if not, return empty charges. OK, makes sense. Right? So believe it or not, but we can actually run this code as a JUnit test. Ooh. So what happened here is from the generated, from the contract, we have generated the test. Mm -hmm. We have a base class in which we said that we don't want to use the real thing. We just want to use the mocked yep. manager. And we have verified that from the syntax point of view, everything is correct. Yes, that's right. So there's one more thing that really was, for me, very, very interesting. Uh, let's go back to the controller. And let's see what kind of a response you send back, you know? String message, string x27? I think that might be called, I think it might stand for extension field 27. I don't know. So what's it's there a, in the extension field 27? I, I have no idea. Maybe we should delete it, see what happens. Sure. I love deleting code. So let's delete it. I mean, what can go wrong, right? I don't know. We'll see. Nothing. Come on. I mean, I would push with force to master. But maybe let's run the test. Yeah, let's run the test first. Yeah, okay. Why not? I mean, this really makes no sense, but yeah, let's do it. Okay. I think it might work. But in a good way or a bad way? No. Is it's, it a feature or a bug? I don't know. Nobody really knows what EX27 stands for. Lots of theories around the office of what that field actually means. Yeah, so I can see that we already have a problem with the internet, so. OK, I'm going to work this around. That's what I do for a living. Let's run only the impl. OK, so what happened here is the plugin analyzed that we have uh, 
This is the Maven plugin. It analyzes mm -hmm. that, hey, you have some contracts, right? Here, it converted them to the stubs, and it generated tests. So let's see, like, let's scroll down. Oh, we have some oh. test failures. Well, what was the failure? What was the issue? Uh, insurance service test? Oh, man. Did I you guess write it? it? No, I guess the insurance guys are using this. Oh, oh, oh so, yeah, yeah because audit. there was another contract there, right? That's right, that's right. Okay, so let's go to insurance service. Oh, 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 yeah, that's embarrassing. So there's an X27, and they say they're using it. It's a UUID, actually. You know? I'm going to have a word with them and see what they actually use this field for. But I li I'm liking this here. What I'm seeing is that I have that freedom to kind of evolve my API. And as my API evolves, if I break someone, I know who I broke. I guess that's why it's called consumer-driven contract? More or less. OK. Yeah, that's the thing. OK, so uh, maybe you'll. Let's say summarize this section. Sorry. Sure, sure. Um, Here you can click. No, that one. Cool. So basically, the, the, the workflow that we're going for is that as a consumer, you start by writing a contract that defines the, uh, how you interact uh, with the API that you're using. Uh, you then send a pull request of your contract to the producer of that API. Once a producer of the API gets the contract, you can then write an integration test in your project that uses that. Um, and you can run your, that integration test as part of your pipeline. On the producer side of the API, what you're doing is you review these pull requests that come in that contain contracts. And if you accept them, you, you're going to then be running your consumer's contract as part of your own CI. So the tests are kind of happening in two locations. They happen on the consumer side, where the consumer runs their integration tests against the generated uh, stubs. Um, and it happens on the producer side, where you're testing the actual implementation uh, from the point of view of the consumer. Um, and this is really about a few hard problems that we've all encountered. Number one is, how can something be added to an API without breaking clients? Anybody had to deal with that at work? Or how can I remove something uh, without breaking my clients? Or how can I find out which features of my API are actually being used? That's typically another really difficult one for us to do. Or uh, you know, what we all hear about is velocity, right? We want to be able to release more things faster and not break anything. We want to get safety by going faster rather than by going slower. Uh, and there are a bunch of patterns for evolving this. You know, uh, consumer-driven contracts is one of the patterns that you can use. Um, these other ones, I think you may have heard, heard of them before. Things like tolerant reader, as in your, your service is willing to accept requests from uh, older clients and newer clients. Uh, things like putting schema versions on the APIs, like v1, v2. Having well-defined extension points, like EX27, I guess. Not uh, really, that was an extension point, yeah. I guess, yeah. Uh, and, uh, uh, and various other things. But I'm really a big fan of these consumer-driven contracts at this point. And the reason why is when you look at your applications, when you have a provider contract, you might have a service that returns a well-defined object of some kind. And from the point of view of the service provider, it might look like everybody actually cares about everything that the API is doing for them. But reality is more like this. You know, my client A might only care about the, some of the uh, fields that the service returns, right? And, and, and what we want to do is we want to be testing the service from the point of view of the client, which means that every consumer is going to write an executable test. And they, you, you can use Spring Cloud Contract to write it. You could write that test manually. Um, and then once you have the test, you're only going to test the things you care about. So if the API returns 50 fields for you, then you would only um, test uh, the five fields that you cared about. So this is the difference between a contract and a schema, right? Yeah. Yeah, the, the contract isn't the schema. It's just this is what I care about. So long as I'm getting it, I don't really care what the producer is producing. I just want the producer not to break me. And I think this solves a really huge problem that all of us have run into in the enterprise, whereby we're trying to evolve what we're doing. And 
things end up taking a lot of time because we have to check with team A and team B and team C and team D and give people notices that we're going to uh, you know, change something. And of course, in a microservices world, that's not gonna work because we wanna be able to deploy all the microservices we have independently of each other. Um, so uh, this is a diagram, you know, this stuff is, I think was published in 2006, right? So nothing new, nothing so, new. So consumer driven contracts is, is an, it's an idea that's been around for a while. And here's, you know, diagrammatically representing that if every consumer gives a contract for what they care about, then the union of all the consumer contracts is effectively what the provider should provide. Right? If you provided everything that your consumers wanted, then all the other stuff that you're not, that you're doing that they don't use, it's just all waste. And you could just go and delete that code. Um, Here's another way to look at it, whereby you, know, you, you, you have that collection of all the consumer contracts, and you have your, um, uh, your service logic, you have your API, the consumer contracts are interacting with the API, and you have that confidence that every time you change something in your implementation, your clients aren't going to come screaming at you that you broke something, and that's, that's a huge, uh, huge thing. Um, so the benefits of the consumer-driven contracts, one is it aligns you, aligns the service providers with the business goals. You don't end up implementing features that nobody cares about. Uh, it gives you insights into how people are using your API. Um, it makes evolving your API easier. And uh, it's a really good for making continuous delivery better and making it more meaningful. You know, hopefully helping you get to continuous deployment rather than just continuous delivery. Um, so in, in review, uh, what we're doing is from the same contract, uh, in Spring Cloud Contract in particular, we are going to generate, from the Maven plugin, we're gonna generate the Wiremark stubs and we're going to generate the JUnit tests that you use to uh, execute uh, uh, and test the implementation of the producer API. Okay. Uh, on the stub runner side, uh, you saw how all you got to do is attach the uh, the at stub runner uh, annotation, and then you can specify the reference to the Maven coordinates of your uh, of the stub, and that would allow you to uh, have a an HTTP endpoint that you can use to um, uh, basically talk to this over HTTP to the th to the service that you want to interact with. It's a lot of, uh, it's doing a lot of work for you that if you wanted everybody to do manually, is doable, but it would just increase the amount of effort required for testing, and therefore you will have less tests. But what else can this do? You know, Sprinkler contract is not only what we've seen in this presentation. It's, uh, until now, it's much more. Because you can do exactly the same thing with messaging, right? Uh, we're uh, interacting with Spring Integration Stream and Apache Camel. Um, also, I have like, good information for those who are using Spring Mock MVC. Who's using Mock MVC? Okay, quite a few people. So you're going to be very happy once I show you the slide related to uh, Mock MVC. Uh, because we interact with it in a very nice way. We support Maven and Gradle. We support stateful cases, so scenarios, you know, that you should a request three times at the same endpoint, you will get three different responses. Uh, we support dynamic pieces, because for example, in your uh, API, you might have time, right? You're not gonna set a clock, I mean, you can, to a fixed value for your test, right? We want to do some regular expressions, maybe some, some dynamic bits. We have something called Stubrunner Boot. So Adip has shown that uh, like, if you're using, um, if you wanna go towards uh, continuous delivery or deployment. Uh, there is a project called Spring Cloud Pipelines. So uh, it's an opinionated template of a deployment pipeline. And over there, we are extensively using a process called Stubrunner Boot. So you have seen Stubrunner in your tests, and now imagine that you can run these stubs as a standalone process, right? So you do Java jar, I'm gonna, you're gonna see that in a second. The idea is, uh, let's say you have a Node.js app, and you can start your stubs next to it in you know, separate processes and just call it as if it was a real application. JUnit rule. People ask me uh, a lot like, you know, I'm not using Spring. I don't have Spring Boot, how can I use it? You can use a JUnit rule. 
uh, Spring Cloud integration. So if you're using some load balanced pieces, we know how to redirect your call to the proper Wiremock instance. And we support Pact. Who knows about Pact? Okay, quite a few people. So you'll see that the Pact file can be used instead of the DSL, which means that we will generate tests and create Wiremock stops from the Pact file. Uh, that's a very good question. So the question was, uh, currently we're using, um, we're using, we're using, wait a second, I can't do this and think at the same time. Uh, so currently we're using Groovy DSL. Uh, is, the question was, why not use Kotlin? There is an issue for that. And Spring Cloud Contract has a pluggable architecture, which means pieces of, like for example, what kind of a server you want to run, by default, it's Wiremock. You can hook in your own like, way, for example, some other service like Mock or, or whatever else. Uh, the way you define it is DSL. If you provide a, like, an implementation of an interface that will convert yours to ours and back, you can use whatever you want. There, is already some, uh, there are some people who are trying to make Kotlin work. Uh, what else is pluggable? You can plug in some different ways of generating tests. So for example, I know there is a company that um, is working on generating PHP tests. Yeah, because they can, I guess. Uh, yeah, there, there is a bunch of, if you, if you check out the docs, there's a bunch of things you can plug, plug in. Okay, so I got the slides again. Messaging. So this is an example of a messaging contract where you can't see what I'm pointing at. Okay, so we have, uh, let's say, a label, an input, and an output. So in, with messaging, it's a little bit different than with HTTP, because in HTTP, you send a request, and you'll get a response, right? It's a, like a blocking thing. With messaging, suddenly you got a message, right? So something has to trigger the message. So it, what can trigger a message? A method call can trigger a message. Another message can trigger a message. So you have a bunch of inputs, and as a result, you create an output message that is sent somewhere, like for example, to, to a queue uh, or a topic, something like this, right? So you can define exactly the same thing. It's very useful in case uh, where you are working, um, like writing a test for, for, a, for a, a functionality related to messaging. What typically happens is that people use the very same POJO, same class, to send a test message and to deserialize it, like to receive it. So if you have a typo in your POJO, you'll not catch it because you, you have the same typo on sending and receiving. So if you use this, it's not gonna happen because you define the body, we generate tests to see if, on the producer side of the message if, if that's true, and then on the consumer side of the message, we will, execute, we will send you that body. So if you have a typo, it will fail, like your, t your tests will fail. Mock MVC, so for those who like, don't know Mock MVC, in general you, uh, you can uh, test your API by calling Mock MVC, and here you can see that we're sending a request, a post request to, uh, with content type application JSON with some content, and what we expect back is, you know, for example, that uh, like Adip uh, mentioned this, that there are ways to verify the response using the JSON path, but what is cool, that if you go like, back to your jobs, for those who use Mock MVC, it's enough for you to add a dependency to Spring Cloud Contract Wiremock, and we generate stops out of the box for you. It's enough for you just to package them, and you can, the other teams can start using them immediately. You have to do nothing but add the dependency. If you want to do some more complex things, like over here, for example, we are verifying that the response um, matches some additional regular expressions, and we want to put those into stops, you can do it. Uh, you can also, if you want to, uh, generate a groovy DSL from the ResDoc test. That's possible. Maven and Gradle, so you've seen that the Maven side already, Gradle is uh, like very similar. Scenarios, so you put the files in proper order with a number before it, one to three. So here you have a very interesting scenario of getting drunk, so the first case is you are sober, then you're tipsy, then you're drunk. And you have the previous and current status, so you have 
sober, tipsy, tipsy, drunk, drunk, wasted, right? So if you call the same endpoint three times, you will get like subsequent responses. So this is stateful stub. Dynamic pieces, so you can do it in two ways. So in the body, you can define the body using the groovy map notation. So because essentially a JSON can be a map, a list, an object, a map of lists, a list of maps, objects of lists, et cetera, et cetera. It can be every, everything, but you can define it in a nice way using Groovy. So over here in the request side of the body, you have fields called name and foo. And you can say that the name is any alpha unicode. It's whatever. And the, and the foo, for the consumer side, it can be a regular expression, but for the generated test, you need a concrete value, right? So for the consumer side, it's going to be any boolean. For the producer side, it's going to be just false. And on the response side, you can, for example, reference the request and say, dear, and get me the name from the request, right? This is how you do it, from request. And the other way around, you say that the, for, uh, the quantity field for the consumer will be five, and for the producer will be any number. So in the generated test, we're going to do a um, assertion uh, of, uh, with a regular expression. If you just want to run away screaming, no problem. You can do it in another way. We're using the stubs matchers and test matchers sections. So you can provide the body using the map notation, and then all the dynamic bits you can put in a separate uh, like part, right? And for the response, you can see those the triple uh, uh, the quotes. So this in Groovy means uh, multi-line string. So the first thing is like you can type new line however how often you want to, and you don't have to, you know, like in Java do slash n. It's going to be picked automatically. And as you can see, I mean, Adib, this is much better to like, embed a JSON in string than in Java. I know you would love to do it in Java with all the escaping of double quotes, but you don't have to do it anymore. No, I, I love this. This is, this is excellent. Now, the Node.js approach. So by the way, for those who knows Node.js, I would like to apologize to you, because I know it's like, not at all. So this is my Node.js code. I'm sorry. So this code, what it does, it sends a get request to 9876 to slash frauds. And if the response status makes sense, just log it. And if not, this is great. If it's undefined, do undefined, because otherwise some exceptions were thrown. I could actually catch it and send the question to Stack Overflow, like how to solve this problem. I've seen that's it a, once. That's, that's a good idea. Yeah. So this is my Node.js app. Hey, that's, that that's a great feature request. Any contract test that fails, just post it as a question to Stack Overflow. This is not a good idea because I will have to support it. Oh, man. That's... So, node app JS undefined, right? I have nothing running. Now, stub runner boot, right? So you can create a project, annotate it with enable stub runner server. That's it. Create a jar from it. So you can actually clone it because we have already let's create it. And if you do Java jar, right, on the jar, and you say, I want to work offline, so it's exactly the same thing as you put in the annotation, and say, please download these stubs, what's going to happen is, uh, or you can actually do it also in a YAML and use Spring Cloud CLI by typing in Spring Cloud stub runner. This is pretty sweet. Uh, what's going to happen is that the, uh, the, the standalone process, you can see that it's running a standalone process on port 8750. This will uh, download the stubs. Actually, in this case, it's going to fetch them from M2. Start the stubs. In that case, it was running it on the port 9876, right? And now, if I run node app.js, I get the response from the stub. So node.js doesn't even know that it's talking to a stub. So I guess for all the node.js people who say, oh, it's Java, I don't want to touch it, right? You can't actually, I mean, Spring Cloud Stub Runner. I think it's not very terrible to type those three words, right? Uh, so it should work for you. It, it is for the Node.js developers. They have to admit that oh. there's some things Node can't do. <laughs> OK, not a Spring app. Just use the rule. Stub Runner rule, download stub, work offline. You have a bunch of uh, options that you can pass there. You can even pass your own like mes messaging system. Because if you're using Spring, uh, we will find what kind of a messaging system you're using, what's on your class path. When you're using a JUnit rule, you have to provide it yourself, but it's just one 
uh, one interface to implement. Spring Cloud integration, so if you're using load balanced REST template, uh, it's enough for you to use auto configure stub runner on the other side. If your service ID in the URL is exactly the same as your artifact ID, you have to do nothing. If it's not, you have to provide a mapping. Like service ID X is artifact ID Y. That's it, just one configuration. Pact support. You can't see anything, but basically the thing to the right is the pack thing, and the thing to the left is exactly the same thing with auto configure stub runner, and it's just gonna work out of the box. Because as I said, from the packed file, what we're doing is we're uh, generating tests and generating stubs. So, I guess it's time for questions. So if you have any questions, it's time to ask them now. And we're gonna leave this uh, slide over here if you wanna see some links. So the, if you go to cloud spring IO spring cloud contract, you can read the docs. If you go to Gitter IM spring cloud spring cloud contract, I try not to sleep and answer all of your questions. Um, yeah, time for questions. There you go. Uh, GRPC I knew it. So the question is gRPC support. It's a very good question. Uh, gRPC is uh, schema based, right? It's a, it, it makes no sense to do a contract. So the comment is it would be good to know what consumers care about, which fields, etc. So this is essentially, so we can rephrase the question. I'm using a schema-based protocol, whatever. I would like to know who's using what in my like, API. Uh, this is the problem with any schema, because the schema is, I have sets of inputs, sets of outputs, right? It doesn't tell you how to use it. So we can, uh, there, is a, there is an issue to like, um, take a look into the messaging binary bit. So maybe from this we could evolve to maybe you know, tackling this problem for now. I don't have it in you know, my radar at all, because if you have a schema, you you're already have a schema. So uh, yeah, but this is a very good question. Uh, actually, until now, I wasn't thinking that you know, if you're using a schema, you might really care about knowing who's using what. So thanks for this question. It's really, really good. There you go. That's a very good question. So the question was, uh, if you're using reactive stuff, do you need to adapt it somehow? So um, I have it, one issue to make it like completely painless, so to generate a web client test, test, but it's not there yet. So the only thing you have to do is to turn out, because you've, you've seen until now in the generated test, we were using uh, rest assured with mock MVC, with mock MVC, but if you, in the plugin say, I want the mo test mode explicit, it will send a real request to the real endpoint. Which means that if you're running a reactor-based app, you will just turn on the switch and that's it. Because you're gonna, like from your test, you're gonna send a request. I think you also have to type in async in the contract, which means you have to wait a little bit for, for the response. And that's it, so you have to you know, do two things the explicit mode and the async bit in the contract. So there is a workaround for that, but I will absolutely do my best for 2.0 GA to support it. Very good question. There you go. <sighs> These are very difficult questions. <laughs> there, I think there's an issue for that. I don't support it yet. Uh, I will do my best to support it for 2.0 GA. Yeah. So the, the question for the video was, is oh, there yeah, JUnit 5 support? Thanks. Yeah. Questions, there you go. So the Node.js example uh, shows the Node.js as the consumer. consumer. Uh, is there a use? Very good question. So the Node.js app uh, scenario case, like example, was only shown from the consumer side. You can implement, as I said, Spring contract is pluggable, the way to generate tests for Node.js. It would be very funny, actually, because in a Node.js app, you would have a POM XML with dependencies. You would have to write Maven clean install, but it's just one line. They would execute generate, I mean, test generation. Uh, it's not there yet. I think you would consider using Pact on this side, right? Uh, 
the problem would be you would have to manually or somehow via us uh, convert this to the stub. But that wouldn't be that big a deal. So you would still have to have the POM XML uh, and just execute the stub generation task, right? Because the pack doesn't support the stub creation in the format of Wiremo. So that would be it. So for all those Node.js developers that want to cry right now, I mean, remember that the ultimate goal is to, you know, deploy software that is testable. So if you have to have one POM XML file and execute Maven clean install, I, th I think it's a, not that big a price to pay. Questions? Are there any questions? So if you're shy, oh, there's a question? Yeah. Oh, yeah, go ahead. Oh, this is a great question. What about support for RAML and things like this? RAML support and swag, oh, I knew it, I knew it. It had to, it had to be asked, right? Uh, there is a RAML support in the Incubary project. There was an issue about Swagger support. The issue was closed for a reason. Both Swagger and RAML represent schemas. In RAML, at least you have the example section. So what I did with Ramo, I took whatever you put in the example section and I created contracts, like, you know, stubs, et cetera, out of it. But it makes completely no sense. Because essentially, what you've managed to achieve is to define the contract using YAML, right? Because I take only this section of examples in Ramo. So it's the same as if you put it in a YAML file and that's it. So in my opinion, until now, I see little sense but David Taransky has worked on something that will scan your Swagger uh, right, open API specs and it will generate the full contract like from the, the request and, you know, for the schema. And from this you can start, right? So then you can, you know, from a single contract create maybe 10 for different scenarios. So I think at least now, that's the thing that comes to my mind, that would be the way to do it, you know? So from a RAML or uh, from a, uh, you know, Swagger spec, you'll generate templates from which you'll start the work. Do you have a So the question was about uh, suggested approach to uh, documenting APIs. I mean, ResDocs is really, really awesome. It's the tool. Um, so if you're already, like, there is one thing to say here. Uh, you can do consumer-driven contracts using ResDocs. That's theoretically possible. In that way that the consumers take part in really pull requesting to your ResDocs test, which is kind of, you know, problematic, right? And I think you would have a problem to actually know who is the consumer. So that, that's, they can only say, take part in, let's say, maybe creation of the API, but not, you won't really know who's using you. That's why when you have this approach with ResDocs or that the producer just creates contracts and that's it, it's called producer contracts. So more or less, that would be the part, you know, with the, with the, with the producer contracts. Like, uh, I don't know why I even, like, say, went towards answering this part, because you, your question was different. But uh, related to the documentation, if you're already using ResDocs, then you can create a very nice ad hoc. Uh, you can, from the contracts, generate like, whatever documentation you want, because you basically parse the contract and write whatever you want. But I'd say uh, that um, you should pick one of the two. I mean, there's one idea, like, one, one, way, one situation where you can use both is when you, do, when you have ResDoc tests and want to use messaging. Because for ResDocs, you will not generate messaging bits, right? So you can create ResDoc tests, have contracts for messaging, and manually package both. In Sprinkler Contract Samples, there is a project, Sprinkler Contract Samples. You can see examples of this. I, I do exactly that. Oh, and by the way, there is a, if you type, if you go to Sprinkler Contract Samples, uh, or the, the main page of Sprinkler Contract, you can see the link, to so-called Spring IO, Spring contract. To the right, you'll see a link to the workshops. So I've created workshops that were supposed to be very small, 
but, but ended up a, like a week, week, let's say, amount of uh, uh, tasks for a workshop. So you can go for them and you will learn how to exactly use Prika contract in a consumer-driven fashion, producer contract fashion, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, feel free to check out the workshops. Come again? So, um, uh, wait a second. Cloud, Spring IO, Spring Cloud Contract. I never remember the URL, I have to check it myself. Spring Cloud Contract Workshops, right? If you click, oh, if you click here, there you go. So you have the, how to set it up. You have Adib's presentation. Another presentation. You have introduction to what exactly is there in Spring Cloud Contract. And then you have the tasks. And I'm not joking that it's really gigantic because if you click it, for example, the first section, if the internet's gonna work, you have to scroll really, really a lot. Uh, Marcin misunderstood my request. <laughs> he showed up in Toronto with all of this stuff for a workshop. I think everybody managed to maybe get through the first couple of steps. That was about it. Yeah, I did, we didn't finish this. Yeah. And as I as I uh, shown you, this is only one task, and you have quite a few of those. Yeah. So. But it's like really baby steps. Like write this line, write that line, do this, do that. So, yeah. Question? Yeah, over there. Okay, if I understand correctly, you're saying you have an, your, your service and you're both consuming and producing. What kind of a plugin? Uh, oh, okay. So, so let's say, uh, so you want to use the, let's say, a Jenkins or a Bamboo plugin to do what exactly? You know, I, I think that I don't get the question. Uh, so I think, I think maybe the question is, can I do a CF push on the generated stub so that from my pipeline? Oh, okay, I think I get the question. So, um, so if you're both, this is a Sprinkle Pipelines project that Adib has mentioned. I gave a talk about this yesterday. Also, I had problems with the computer. Something was wrong with me. And it wasn't even my computer. If we scroll down, this is the deployment pipeline. So over here, what happens, you, 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 let's see, your app is both the producer and the consumer of other services, right? Yeah, let's, let's take it offline. More questions? No questions. So if you're shy, you can, let's say, come here and ask us questions. If not, thank you very much. Thank you very much.